Curry says. That means he's never been on a run with me and my teammates. But <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the chance to kind of take a break from the stress of the tail end of the semester to rest in your presence and kind of refocus and gather our strength. We ask that you be with us, teach us, and strengthen us for that final push. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, well, as Dr. Murray said, my name is Riley. I am a double major in communications and pastoral ministries, speaking on behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences. Now, a lot of times people will hear what I'm studying and their follow-up question is, what on earth are you planning to do with that? <laughs> and to be honest, I don't always have a good answer to that question. But the short version is that I am studying to be a journalist and a pastor, likely in some sort of bivocational role, as neither of those professions is really known for raking in the cash. <laughs> They're also not entirely very popular in today's society, but that's neither here nor there. So but I want to kind of bring that bivocational approach to bear on what we're going to talk about today. I want to start with the journalism and then move over into the more pastoral side of things. We'll get to scripture, so if you've got your Bibles, you can stick your thumb in Judges chapter 6. But we're going to start with a concept in journalism that's known as bearing the lead. Now, the core of news writing is essentially the answer to six questions that have been dubbed the five W's and one H, real original. But help me out if, help me out if you know these, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Now ideally, you want to find the answers to these questions and put as much of that information as you can into the first paragraph of the story, what we call the lead. And the reason for that being is that humans have short attention spans, and so if, if they get, the idea is that if they get nothing else, this is the information that they need to know. If they just read the, par the first paragraph and then go on to the comic section, they at least got the main point. So. So that's a lead, what does it mean to bury it? Well, burying the lead is when you start a story off with secondary details and miss the main point. You start off with less relevant information and don't get to the crux of the story until later, if ever. And a lot of times you will see this with, no disrespect to our younger writers in the town, but newbie writers. <laughs> well, that, just because they haven't learned like, what to look for, what they should be focusing on, and what kind of is that main point of the story. And, and then as they, as they grow over time, they kind of get better at focusing on what the main point is and all that good jazz. But you can also bury the lead intentionally. And now you might be thinking, why would someone do that? That sounds nefarious and misleading. <laughs> but let me give you an example of why you might want to do that. So if I were to say that I was born and raised in Spokane, grew up in the church with a loving, hardworking family, run track and cross country here at Northwest, I'm editor-in-chief of the Talon, studying journalism, pastoral ministries, and I'm probably the snarkiest and most sarcastic person you've met, Dr. Brian being the lone possible exception that I'll accept as another answer. <laughs> you'd think, you'd probably think, all right, that's, that's decent, that seems like the lead of his story. But those who know me well would say, hold on, Riley, you just buried the lead because you left out one tiny little detail namely that I am an ex-pornography addict. By the grace of God, I will be three years sober this summer, but, yeah, I can talk to that. Yeah. But to say that most of high school was a bit of a living hell for me would be putting it mildly. What began as, what began through, or through curiosity, if, as much as anything else, and was kind of a way to medicate the isolation and the loneliness that I felt, quickly grew into something that consumed, controlled, and tormented me. And after, after four years of hiding, sneaking, lying to everyone that mattered to me, myself included, I finally broke. I couldn't, I couldn't maintain the deception. And it was only then that God set me free because it was only then that I was honest and allowed him to work in me through my family and through my church community. It was only in surrender that I found freedom. But given that context, it's a little easier to see why someone might want to bury the lead of their story. Talking about my past forces me to be vulnerable, to relive nightmarish chapters of my life, and to expose scars and wounds that frankly haven't healed all the way, and maybe never will. And so I hide, I bury the lead, 
it's, it's easier, it's a lot less painful, and it certainly creates, creates a lot less problems. It, it allows me to construct this kind of false version of myself that's, that's better, that I certainly like a lot better than the person I see in the mirror every day, and that I am convinced might just be able to do what God's calling me to do. But I don't think I'm alone in that desire. Maybe you're here today and your story's like me. You've struggled with an addiction and it hurts just to admit that to family and friends, never mind on stage in First Chapel. And so you bury the lead because you're scared and you're ashamed and you don't want to talk about it. Maybe you bury the lead because somewhere along the line in a dating relationship you cross the line and now you feel damaged, you feel like broken, you feel broken, you feel like damaged goods and you feel like people wouldn't know how to handle it if you told them or that they would look down on you if you did. Maybe you bury the lead because of something that's been done to you. Maybe a, f a, fr a friend, a loved one, someone else who you trusted who should have protected you and instead physically or verbally abused you. Or we just saw through the Clothesline Project stories of, of sexual abuse that shatter our hearts and cause our blood to boil. And so you bury the lead because you don't want to relive it. You don't, you don't think people around you would know how to handle it if, the, if you told them about it and you don't, you don't want to talk about it. Maybe you bury the lead about struggling with stress and anxiety, depression, or heaven forbid, self-harm and thoughts of suicide because you think, I can't be struggling with this. It's not okay for a Christian to be struggling with this. My brothers and sisters wouldn't know how to walk through this with me. Yeah, they would just look down on me instead. I mean, maybe you're none of these. Maybe there's no capital S sin in your life or a big or a defining traumatic moment. Maybe it's just little things like Maybe you were bullied as a kid growing up, or you, at least in the past, or maybe even currently, are an expert in tearing people down. And, and so there's no, maybe no defining flaw or, or problem, but there's just this general sense that you're not who you should be, that you're not, you're not qualified for what you're called to, and so you bury the lead. You construct this, ver you kind of, you hide the flaws in the corner, hope they never see the light of day, and you think that if people see this version of me, they'll like me better, because if they saw the real me, they wouldn't. And I don't feel qualified for what I'm called to do, and certainly for fitting into this whole church thing. And so you bury the lead, you hide, you construct this false narrative of yourself that you think maybe, just maybe, will be good enough. Now, fortunately for our sakes, we're not the first ones to feel like that. If we look at the story of Gideon, we see another instance of bearing the lead, this time out of fear. Let's look at how Gideon describes himself in Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 15. He said to him, please, Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Look, my family is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the youngest in my father's family. Now, in good journalistic fashion, we are going to run a little fact check of our friend Gideon here. Manasseh was one of the two sons of Joseph, so when you're, when you're the son of granddad's favorite, life's probably going to treat you all right. But they were also a fairly sizable tribe, and their territory allotment in the Promised Land was rivaled only by Judah's. So even the weakest family in Manasseh would have been a force to be reckoned with. But even that description falls short. Later in the passage, we see that Gideon's father was a was a landowner of decent wealth because he was the one who built and maintained the, the town's altar to Baal. And that, that family had a decent number of servants at their command. So Gideon had resources and wasn't quite as helpless as he painted himself out. So what's, what's the issue? What's Gideon's problem? Fear? Simple as that. Let's look at the moment when God com comes to him. In verse 11, it says, The angel of the Lord came to him, or the angel of the Lord came, and he sat under the oak that was in Oph Ophrah, and which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite. Sorry, Dr. Himes, I believe I just butchered that royally. But. <laughs> His son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. Now, the wine press would have been a shallow depression in the rock, not where you normally would thresh wheat, but it was far less exposed than the threshing floor 
and thus would have kept Gideon safer from the Midianite marauders that were terrorizing Israel at the time. We see this fear again in verses 25 through 27. God commands Gideon to tear down his father's altar to Baal, and he does it. But verse 27 adds a little footnote. So Gideon took 10 of his male servants and did as the Lord told them. But because he was afraid of his father's family, now, wait a minute, I thought they were weak. And the men of the city, to do it in the daytime, he did it at night. So fear is the problem. Even at the moment God calls him, Gideon is hiding like a coward. So what does God do about this? Let's look at what he says in verse 12. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, valiant warrior. Now most translations will render this, that last phrase, mighty warrior, but I like this particular translation, the CSB's way of phrasing it, because it speaks directly to Gideon's insecurities. He feels afraid, he feels like a coward. God comes and says, you're brave. He's hiding and God says, you're a warrior. He speaks Gideon's destiny over him long before it appears to be true. Now we'll see Gideon struggle for the rest of his life, really, with his identity. But once he accepts that God is with him, he's able to do what God is calling him to. God answers Gideon's objections with a promise in verse 16. But I will be with you, the Lord said. You will strike down Midian as if they were one man. And Gideon does precisely this, leading a company of 300 men to rout a Midianite army many times their size. But it's only as he accepts what God says about him and, wh and who he is and that God will be with him that he's able to do these things. That God is with him and that he's a valiant warrior. And this way of phrasing it is so encouraging to me. Because so often I feel too broken for what God's calling me to do. I feel too flawed. I'm an introvert. I'm sarca sarcastic. I don't play nice with others. I'm not exactly what most people would define as a pastor. And I'm afraid. I'm afraid of failing. I'm afraid of not measuring up. And I'm just, I'm just afraid. But God speaks my destiny over me. For those of you that are familiar with, Gaelic's, with Gaelic names, the name Riley means valiant. Wow. I feel like a coward and God calls me brave. I feel broken, God says you're a warrior. Yeah. And he says the same to you. Where you feel afraid, God says you're brave. Where you feel broken, God says you're whole. Hallelujah. Where you feel like I'm not good enough, I'm not made for this, God says I made you from this from the beginning. When you feel like you're unworthy of being loved, God says, you're mine. I've known you from the earliest moments of life. And God says, I don't care what anyone else thinks of you because I'm the one that made you. So I get to decide who you are and what you are. And I say that you are literally to die for. You think you're not qualified? You think you're not good enough? Try me. I've done a lot more with a lot less. And the story that God speaks over you is the only one that matters. It's the only one. But you have to own your story to accept that. Because you can't accept what God says about your story unless you own every chapter of it. Like for me, I, like, I hate talking about the fact that I've struggled with pornography addiction. It's a chapter that I wish I could bury, burn, all of the above. But if I don't talk about it, I can't explain how I've become more of a forgiving person, less judgmental, less self-righteous, and have a far better understanding of grace than I did before. And I can't, I can't explain the renewed joy that I have in my life if I don't talk about that. So if I don't talk about it, I save a little bit of face, yes. But I also miss the chance to say, look at what God's done. Yeah. Look at what he set me free from. Look how he's making me new. Hallelujah. So by burying the lead in my story, I ultimately bury the lead in God's. And I'm not able to fully step into what he's calling me into. 
So if you're looking for my sermon in a sentence, it's this. When you bury the lead, you bury God's deeds. When you bury the lead in your own story, you also bury the chance to talk about what God has done in and through you. If you bury, the, you bury the parts of the story that you don't like, that you're ashamed of, that you wish weren't there, then you also bury all that God has done through that because you, without those chapters, you would not be who you are today. Yeah. And so you have to own your story. Every letter, every sentence, every dark ch- chapter where it seemed like all hope was gone and that there was no chance of a better tomorrow. It's not easy, it's not always fun, it's definitely not fun to stand up on stage and say what I've said today, but it's the only way to live. Imagine what scripture would look like if it just glossed over the flaws of the people that, are, that have gone before us in our faith. That'd be pretty depressing. <laughs> we see these examples of superhuman strength, endurance, and faith and think, I can never measure up to that. If that's the standard, then I'm, I'm doomed. Sorry, a new filter came through there. <laughs> yeah. But fortunately for our sake, that's not what we see. God's story is full of misfits, outcasts, prodigals, and rebels. It's full of murderers, adulterers, cowards, and thieves. These are the people that are the heroes of our faith. And these are the ones, and it's, it's the ones that are broken and weak that God delights in using. Because what the world calls strong, God knows is not. And so he delights in using the ones that are broken that don't fit the mold. Because they're proof that it's only through his, glo- through his strength that we are able to do things. Yeah. It hurts to own your story. It hurts to admit that you're not perfect, that God's grace is the only hope you have in your life. But once you do, you're in pretty good company. Men and women who conquered kingdoms, witnessed incredible miracles, and changed the very course of human history. Not because they were perfect or strong or had everything put together, but because they trusted God and they listened when he said, you are valiant and I am with you. They realized that no matter what they'd done or been through, God was greater. And he's greater than whatever you've gone through and are going through. Not even death itself could stand against our Savior. So as long as there's breath in your lungs, as long as as long as you wake up and face another day, there's still a fight to be had, and God is not done with you yet. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the until the day of Christ. And that is a promise that gives me so much hope. So own your story. And what would it look like if we did? I'm not suggesting that we need to be shouting every dirty detail from the rooftops, far from it. But what if we were all a little bit more honest about what we've gone through, what we are going through? I think for one, we'd be a lot less judgmental. Because when you know someone's story, you're a lot more gracious towards them. One of the funny things about human psychology is that we explain our own deeds by circumstance and we explain others' deeds by their character. But if we know someone's story, we're a lot more likely to empathize than to criticize. We're a lot more likely to throw our arms around them than to throw rocks. And we also wouldn't we wouldn't feel this need to put up a front or be perfect. We wouldn't feel the need to bury the lead of our own stories because we would realize, hey, I'm not, bro- I'm not perfect, I'm broken, but so is everyone else in the room. We don't, need to put up a f- we don't need to act better than we are because God's grace is enough. And most of all, we'd have hope. We'd have hope for the challenges, the circumstances, the trials and the temptations that we face. We could look at our circumstances and not belittle them, but say, look at what God has already done in me and everyone else, and look what he's continuing to do. He's got this. He's never failed, and he's not about to start now. We can step into what God has called us, 
knowing that the battle is his. There's a verse from the song Confidence by Sanctus Real that puts it so beautifully. It says, I'm not a warrior, I'm too afraid to lose. I feel unqualified for what you're calling me to do. But God, with your strength, I've got no excuse because broken people are exactly who you use. So let's not bury the lead of our stories because God already wrote the lead. He says, you are a valiant warrior and I am with you. And so I want to leave you with two reflection questions to end out. I'm going to get done a little earlier, but if y'all are anything like me, the end of this semester is not shaping up to be nice. <laughs> so the two questions I want to leave you with are, number one, what parts of my story do I need to own? And also, where do I need to let what God says define my story? And so my prayer for you is this, that you will own the parts of your story, even the ones that you don't want to, that hurt to do it, because it's only then that you're able to step into what God says about you. He says that you are valiant, I am with you. I made you for this. I, I've never failed before, I'm not about to start now, and I'm not gonna let you fail either. So, Father God, we ask that you be with us as we're wrapping up the semester. I ask that you provide at a way for my brothers and sisters still trying to get all their chapel credits that a way would be provided and that you give us strength to not just finish the semester, but finish it well and to finish it with joy. And we ask that as we're going forward, help us to own our stories, even the parts that we don't like, and to accept what you say about us, that you've made us brave and that you are with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you.